On this episode of China Unscripted, the Philippines goes up against a Chinese armada. They have an unusual strategy to fight back, and it's working. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Matt Ganesta. And I'm Shelley Zhang. And Chris will be back next week. And joining us today is David Day. He's the chairman of the Global Risk Mitigation Foundation. He's one of the leading international legal practitioners on the Indo-Pacific region, including the Philippines. David, thanks for joining us. Hey, it's nice to be here and thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So we're here to talk about the Philippines. Now, uh, China, the PRC, claims almost the entire South China Sea, including uh, a bunch of islands and shoals that are very close to the Philippines. And this, is, of course, has been the source of conflict for some time. Uh, but tell us about the latest incident that's happened there. Um, well, what was happening was there was a um, what's called a, a Rory mission, R-O-R-E. That's a rotation and resupply exercise to uh, an island shoal called Ayunan Shoal, which is about 120 miles off of the island of Palawan. And this is the same thing that we call the, South, the Second Thomas Shoal. It is, correct. Second Thomas Shoal. And this is where the Philippines has this, um, what we like to refer to as the rusting condominium uh, beach there, which is a World War II landing craft uh, ship that's rusting away. And it has anywhere from about 12 to 15 uh, Navy sailors on board. And so these missions are designed to uh, rotate those sailors off and supply them with food and water. And this most recent incident follows many that um, you've seen in the media over the last many, many months and years. And this particular one, what happened was that uh, China brought in just enormous steel hull forces to try to block this resupply mission. So, um, <clears throat> Matt, just for uh, just in case you're interested the Chinese brought some 38 vessels to try to block five coming from the Philippines. The five Philippine ships consisted of three Coast Guard ships and two um, small wooden boats, maybe 30, 40 feet, that are privately rented and manned by the Philippine Navy, uh, not wearing uniforms. Like the fishing catamarans? No, they are single-hulled um, fishing boats, um, and they're carrying food and water and supplies. And the idea is to get into inside this shoal, get up to the to the Sierra Madre, which is uh, uh, BRP fifty-seven is the number on the ship, and rotate uh, sailors off and supply food. So this most recent incident, the Chinese had some 38 vessels up against the Philippines Five. And the Philippines Five had three steel hulls. Those are Philippine Coast Guard ships, plus these two wooden fishing boats uh, at the 30 to 40 foot length um, carrying food. And so there was the, the standard um, bullying, pushing around and dangerous maneuvering um, and the good news is that the Philippine uh, Navy seamen aboard uh, the resupply ships managed to outmaneuver the Chinese yet again and, and mission accomplished. But it's, it's a increasing progressive um, bullying narrative that in the past has resulted in uh, uh, some minor collisions. Um, the, the Chinese got uh, ahead of themselves on one that occurred back, I guess it was in September, and they ran one of their ships up on the reef and crippled it, and the Philippine Coast Guard took great delight in offering to tow, tow the ship off, but uh, the Chinese declined. So that's, that's kind of where we are, and it, this situation continues to escalate. It's, a, it's very dangerous, it's very unsafe, and it's the maritime equivalent, Matt, of what you heard uh, Dave Stilwell talk about, about these uh, maneuvers that are taking place uh, with uh, U.S., Canadian, and Australian aircraft, very dangerous maneuvers coming very close, and it's, it's continuing to escalate, and there will be 
likely some serious accident coming up. You said that the the Chinese co- uh, the Chinese side had thirty eight ships. What kind of ships were they in comparison to the three Coast Guard vessels and two fishing boats on the Filipino side? And is this an escalation? Have they always sent so many ships? No, I think it is an escalation. Um, this most recent one, uh, there were uh, ten ships from the Chinese Coast Guard. Those would be steel hulls. Another 10 ships, uh, vessels, so far as I know, from the uh, uh, People's Liberation Army Navy, full-on military craft. And uh, uh, and there were, uh, the balance were uh, Chinese militia all steel hull, big ships. Um, I, I think, you know, we have to be careful about the term, the the um, Chinese maritime militia, because those are steel hull ships that are supposed to be out there fishing, but they don't really carry the crews. And they're, in uh, many cases, they're carrying uh, armaments. So they're basically military ships operating under a civilian disguise. This whole um, strategy comes uh, from the PLA uh, announced some years ago called a cabbage strategy. And that is the plan to block uh, various islands or reefs, kind of like you would with a cabbage, with all kinds of ships surrounding it so that it's impossible to get through. And this is one of the challenges that the Philippines has. I mean, within their exclusive economic zone, they have a blockade going. This is at Sen- Second Thomas Shoal. And they have a f- series of full-on military bases, and, and one of them is Mischief Reef, which is about 23 miles from this uh, second Thomas Shoal. It's very close. And well, what has China done with Mischief Reef in terms of you know, how have they occupied and militarized it? Well, um, China has, this is one of the um, islands where, or reef locations where China has uh, utilized what we call the Great Wall of Sand and has built up a, you know, a major military base there with runway and uh, facilities. They've got a small port uh, and it, it is right inside, well inside uh, the, the Philippine uh, exclusive economic zone. And in, it's very close to this uh, a Union Shoal where the Sierra Madre is, Second Thomas Shoal. So what is the kind of, what is the reason that the PRC, the CCP, cares so much about Second Thomas Shoal and the Philippines having the Sierra Madre and having these uh, Navy sailors on there? Because it's, it obviously bothers them enough to send so many ships to try to harass these uh, missions. So what is... What is the reason behind that? Well, I mean, Shelley, that, I mean, that's a really, really important question. And it, it, it really relates to the, the um, belligerence, if you will, the bullying of China. They're trying to clean out all of the sovereignty claims that the Philippines has uh, inside of its so-called nine-dash line. And this whole process... Um, in terms of starting to build uh, presence uh, in the in the Spratly Islands, uh, started way back in the mid 1990s. The Chinese started putting modest little fishing shelters, and they gradually uh, increased with this concept of salami slicing. So they got bigger and bigger operations. And then, if you recall, in um, I guess it was in 2012, there was this big Scarborough Scarborough Shoal incident off of the island of Luzon. And uh, the Scarborough Shoal is a fantastic fishing ground about 120 miles out. And it's it's kind of a triangular uh, reef, if you can imagine it, with a little small opening with all kinds of fish in there. And so it's an important... um, asset for the Philippines, well inside their exclusive economic zone. And so there was an incident there that um, our country was involved in, the United States. And the what happened was that 
the Philippines lost sovereignty over that and China has taken it over and blocks uh, access for the Philippine fishermen. And so you recall recently, uh, China in, attempted to put a net uh, to block the Chinese, the uh, Philippine fishing fleets from even getting into Second Thomas Shoal. And you recall there was a, an incident where the Philippine uh, uh, Coast Guard went out and had a diver go down and there were video cameras and everything. You can see him cutting the rope that opened up that Second Thomas, I mean, in the um, Scarborough Shoal for fishing. So it, it's it's a progressive salami slicing effort to essentially clean this little country called the Philippine Republic of the Philippines, clean it out of all of its island claims so that China can have it. Yeah, we, we had actually uh, taken a Filipino fishing boat out to the Scarborough Shoal in 2016. And e even at the time, it was the mouth to that shoal was, was blocked by a bunch of uh, Chinese Coast Guard and probably maritime militia ships. I think there were may have been two naval ships out there. They were yeah. pretty large. They were they were pretty big ships, and we were on this tiny little <laughs> catamaran. Uh, I thought we were going to be boarded, but uh, well, I was going to say if you if you look at satellite views overhead, what you will see throughout the West Philippine Sea and the East Sea of Vietnam, and if you want to use China's terms, the South China Sea. What you will see are these rafts of um, Chinese maritime militia ships all lashed together like a big wall. And there are groups of them all over the place, and they stand ready to back up the Chinese Coast Guard and assist in the harassment and pushing around and bullying. But they're not out there fishing. That's a, that's a big misnomer. They're there as a... Uh, uh, deputized support for the Chinese Coast Guard. I remember there being one of those situations where satellite images captured some of these like lashed together ships. Yeah, we'll put right? that on screen here. And then there were more and more of those ships. And then they tried to come up with some excuse like, oh, they were just trying to shelter from a typhoon. It's like they got caught out basically. Right. And then they had to disperse the ships and come up with an excuse. And, and for safety, lash like completely together in a way that is absolutely unsafe to do uh, in a typhoon. Yes, and, and, um, and, and that concept goes back to having the, the steel-hulled firepower in this concept of this cabbage theory or, or tactic where they have enough steel hulls that they can block, surround, harass, uh, in any way that they need to. I, I want to go back to 2012 because it's relevant to what happened this year. So in 2012, the way the U.S. was involved, as, as I recall, was that the, the, the U.S. said they essentially they would broker the deal to get the, the Chinese ships to leave and the Philippine ships to leave. Uh, and after agreeing to everything uh, through on three sides, the Philippine ships left as agreed and the Chinese ships did not leave. And despite their immediately violating the agreement, the U.S. did nothing. Well, I mean, was there something that the U.S. could have done at that point? Yeah, besides strongly worded statements, there, there could have been something, right? Yep. It's worse than that, Matt. Um, because that incident um, really illustrates uh, the beginnings of this the severity of the problems that both the Republic of the Philippines and the United States and other claimants are now having to deal with, all because of that incident that you described. But a piece of the backstory there is that um, as that deal was being uh, brokered, if you will, or mediated, the, the person in the middle doing the mediation was a gentleman by the name of Kurt Campbell. And what happened was that um, at the time, the Philippine ambassador to Washington was a man named Jose Quisha. And Ambassador Quisha went to Kurt Campbell and said, look, we are your friend. We are your ally. If you tell us that we need to pull our ships out, we will do that as part of the deal. We will honor our part of the bargain. But I'm telling you, sir, that... When we pull our ships out, the Chinese are not going to leave. They're going to stay. This boneheaded deal 
caused seething anger in the Philippines. And this is a piece of um, what I call the, the, the um, uh, poorly thought out effort that began to, to uh, in later years, start to push in the Duterte administration uh, the Philippines away from the U.S. and and you saw uh, President Duterte take a take a step towards China, and we as a country with some boneheaded foreign policy moves uh, contributed to that. Now there were some others that followed after Scarborough Shoal, but it is going to take a generation or two before the Filipinos get over that because they feel that you know we stabbed them in the back and they lost some sovereignty sovereign jurisdiction of their country over that. And they're going, that's why this second Thomas Shoal, the Philippines, they are not going to give up on this. They are going to keep resupplying that Sierra Madre. And then there will be a time when they have to uh, have to do something about its uh, physical deterioration. And that's going to be another challenge coming up. You mentioned that Kirk Campbell uh, was the one who brokered the deal that the Chinese violated and the U.S. didn't push back properly. How has the U.S. responded to this latest incident? Uh, and are we are we as a country doing any better now? Well, the answer to that is yes and yes. Um, so, so as an example, um, you're getting uh, some some statements coming out of the uh, the U.S. embassy in Manila, the ambassador there. Uh, uh, condemning the the conduct of China, which is a refreshing change, and um, the State Department uh, and the Defense Department are are issuing statements now. I mean, it's long overdue, but they're doing it. And I think perhaps the most interesting thing that um, in what's going on in terms of these resupply missions to a Union Shoal um, out there to the Sierra Madre is that uh, U.S. Indo-PACOM, which is about three miles from where I'm sitting right now, they are supplying a P-8 or other type of surveillance aircraft overhead. And uh, you'll see reports of the American aircraft overhead. Well, this is really important, and it's coordinating um, with the uh, joint military operation on the island of Palawan, which runs these uh, resupply missions at uh, what's called the Western Command. And so what's happening is that the United States with these uh, uh, surveillance aircraft over top are providing real-time communications and and, and, um, coverage of what's happening and that's being transmitted back to the command and control centers at Westcom on Palawan and into Manila so that the Philippine military can watch and they have uh, real tight communications with their their teams as they're going out. And I think this is a really a big first step for the United States to be involved in this because it it um, with this type of real time communications, it helps uh, there's. Uh, any any type of uh, blow up or problem that the the Philippine military command back uh, on Palawan can step in and, and uh, issue orders or withdraw or something like that. So there's a huge amount of military resources, both from the Philippines and the U.S., going to uh, preserve the Sierra Madre uh, on the Second Thomas Shoal. Why does the Philippines and the U.S. care so much? I can't speak for the United States, um, but I can I can tell you that um, the Philippines uh, is quite frankly being tired, very tired of being pushed around by China. And um, when uh, shortly after uh, President Marcos took office, uh, he made several statements about. Uh, the the country is not giving up one square inch to China, and he's made uh, taken a very firm stand, which has been adopted by the the Philippine military leadership as well as its Coast Guard, and uh, so this is now translated into uh, 
strong public opinion and support in the Philippines. And I, I think that uh, if anybody thinks that the Philippines is going to back off of this thing just because it's a rusted old ship in a reef, I mean, it's a, become a matter of national pride now. They're not going to let China take any more territory from them. I mean, it's that simple. So I'm going to put that uh, image back on screen of this rusting hole of the Sierra Madre. And, and you said that it's, it's incredible to me that there's even people living on this ship, you know, but the, obviously they have to do that to sort of occupy, but it's only got a few more years left. And so like what happens next Does the Philippines build their own great wall of sand and build a military base there or like what, what's next? Well, that, that issue, uh, Matt, is being discussed uh, at the, is of course very sensitive, uh, being discussed at the very senior levels in, in Manila right now. And um, uh, all I can tell you is the Philippines is not going to let that Sierra Madre end their presence on Second Thomas Shoal. They'll, they'll make some additional plan and what that plan is, uh, you know, I don't, that's above my pay grade at this point in time, what they're exa exactly going to do. I mean, our foundation has offered some ideas, but uh, I think, I think that um, anybody that thinks, believes that when the Sierra Madre splits apart and slides into the sea, that's, that's going to be the end of the Philippines claim to second Thomas Shoal. I think they're dreaming because that's not going to happen. There will be a replacement, a rebuilding, uh, something else to uh, uh, further the claim of Philippine sovereignty on Second Thomas Shoal. And of course, this, this really bothers the Chinese because they've got a major military base 23 miles away and they would like to get this, you know, the last thing they want is, is for Second Thomas Shoal to develop into a significant uh, military base for the Philippines. One thing that's ironic is that now that the CCP has made such a big deal of stopping these resupply ships, it's pushed the U.S. to have all these surveillance uh, uh, planes flying overhead, which are also probably picking up on a bunch of activity at Mischief Reef, the Chinese base, that the Chinese almost certainly don't want, right? Right. And, and you know, you know, Matt, it's kind of like, it's kind of like this... Um, this uh, famous, I think it's a corollary to Murphy's Law uh, that says that when you find yourself in a hole, the first rule is quit digging. And, and, and this is what uh, the Chinese don't see is happening because I think if you take a step back and you look at the big picture, because the uh, Philippines has been so... Uh, so tough and continuing to to stand their ground, if you will, what's happening is it's influencing um, the United States. And the United States is saying, now, wait a second, we got this, this modest little ally of ours, we better uh, step up. Um, I think the technical term is grow a little set. And, uh, and so and you, you see the same thing happening with the Japanese. And Prime Minister Kushida was in uh, in Manila just a uh, couple, three weeks ago, and he's one of the, I think, five foreign leaders that have ever um, been invited to speak before their joint session of their Congress. And Japan has announced that it's going to, to uh, provide another 12 very large Coast Guard vessels for the Philippine Coast Guard. And... There's an announcement uh, coming out of Japan and Philippines that they're forming a bilateral uh, defense agreement. And I think we're going to see a, um, you know, kind of a Japanese Philippine version of uh, uh, the EDCA alignment so that we'll see more Japanese forces training with the Filipinos and Filipinos training in Japan. And in fact, there's a there's an exercise uh, underway right now called um, Operation Kamandag in which uh, there are 50 Japanese self-defense uh, soldiers participating. And they're not just, not just observers. They're actually there with about 1,700 um, 
uh, Filipinos and about a thousand from the U.S. There's some Brits there and some from South Korea. And so this this uh, stand your ground uh, tactic that the Philippines has undertaken is, uh, I think, really invigorating the whole military uh, situation in the first island chain. And so we're seeing new alliances formed and um, uh, it's, it's, it's all very important, uh, not only from a Chinese movement in, in the South China Sea, but also in terms of the defense of Taiwan. In light of these incidents, and, and of course, the, the new Marcos administration, uh, the U.S. is now been invited, essentially, to step up its military presence in the Philippines, including military bases. So what's going on there, and what's the sort of larger implication with with uh, defense, including Taiwan? Well, originally, um, we had these, uh, the United States had these EDCA sites, and they had five um, uh, sites throughout the Philippines that uh, they could store supplies and use for uh, U.S. military operations with the permission of the Philippines. And then just, just recently here in April, they added another four sites. And... Um, uh, interestingly, a couple of them were up uh, in Cagayan and Isabella provinces in the northern part of Luzon. And that's that becomes very important in terms of su- the United States having uh, supplies and forces prepositioned for a defense of southern Taiwan. And if you recall, during the Balakatan exercises uh, this past uh, April and May, there was an amphibious training of an amphibious landing on one of the islands uh, in the Batanas group north of Luzon. And uh, so you had U.S. Marines, Philippine Marines, and they did an amphibious landing of a HIMARS uh, piece of equipment. And uh, so just as a reminder for all the viewers here, um, there is a Philippine island, Mavulas, out on the edge of the Bashi Channel, which is only 88 miles from Taiwan, so that this whole movement of new EDCA sites and the Balakatan trainings that have been taking place are really um, setting up and sending China a message that, hey, you know, those southern landing beaches of Taiwan may not be as open as you think they are. In order for, for China to really either blockade Taiwan or to do any type of uh, landings in the southern southern part of the island, they have to control, China has to control the Bashi Channel, which is a deep rough water channel that runs between Taiwan and the very northern islands of the Philippines. And so the command and control of that whole northern Luzon, those islands all the way to Taiwan is really critical. And the United States and the Philippines are starting to really move into this area, which is a good thing. Now, David, just to take a quick step back and look at the situation a few years ago before, during the President Duterte's administration, you know, you had, you mentioned Duterte stepping closer to China, partially as a result of the Scarborough Shoal incident. You had the Philippines doing things like they joined the Belt and Road. Um, There were lots of like friendly overtures. How did we get from that point to where we are today? Was it something the CCP did? Did they push too hard? Did the Philippines like have a change of heart? What happened here? Well, I think uh, another, I mean, that's a really uh, fascinating question, Shelley. And I, I think that what we, in order to really examine it, what you would see um, if the group of us went around and we surveyed American journalists and media what we would see frequently is the concept or the English word pivot that Marcos has pivoted or Philippines has pivoted. And that's really a misnomer. And the reason it's a misnomer is Duterte takes office. And um, what happens then is that this group of elite international lawyers issues an arbitration award that was very carefully drafted And essentially, Shelley, what happened was that it legally squeegeed away 
China's nine dash line. Effectively, that's what it did. As an ally, what happened was the Duterte administration turned to the United States and say, hey, we got this arbitration award. Will, will you support us? Will you help us to enforce it? And again, there was a boneheaded decision made by the, by the, the administration in power then in our country that, um, and, and effectively what the Obama administration did was a Pontius Pilate. They washed their hands of the whole thing and said, you know, we're not getting involved. Now, Shelley, effectively what that means is at the time that the, the judicial decision was rendered, the nine dash line was wiped out. But by saying that we're not going to support the enforcement of the of the award, effectively what that means is um, that the Clinton State Department and Kirk Campbell reinstituted the nine dash line. And um, of course, the seething anger that that caused in the Philippines added to the the um, problems and the feelings about being betrayed by the Scarborough Shoal incident added to Duterte's frustration with the United States. And then there was some um, international conference or meeting in which there was uh, a, a feeling on the part of uh, President Duterte that uh, pres our President Obama had slighted him in some fashion. And so he starts seeing the Belt and Road develop and maybe the prospect of free money. So then that's when he steps off in one foot uh, leaning on one foot towards China. But coming back to the concept of the pivot, what's really important to remember is that although Rodrigo Duterte personally starts making statements and, and visits China, and there's all this talk of uh, loans coming to the Philippines or grants, and they're involved in Belt and Road projects, um, there are two very key advisors in his cabinet, cabinet members, that were very strong American supporters. One was Teodoro Loxin, who was the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, and the other was Delphin Lorenzana, the Secretary of National Defense. And those two gentlemen combined with Jose Romualdez, the then ambassador to the Philippines, who's still uh, ambassador to the United States, um, they worked to hold the alliance together during this difficult period. Now, the problem what, that Duterte had was that, that China promised all this money and they never delivered. They built a little, I guess it was an $18 million, some dinky bridge across the Pasig River. That's all they actually did. So today, what's happened is you've seen the Philippines withdraw from the Belt and Road and the three major infrastructure projects that China was supposed, supposed to, to uh, finance the Philippines is withdrawn and is looking elsewhere for financing for those projects. It said they, we don't want the Chinese to finance it. So that's the, 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 the shift um, from the Duterte administration over to the Marcos administration is much more nuanced than uh, just calling it a pivot, which you didn't, I know. So the U S screwed up, you know, in 10 years ago, uh, and then later, China came in and they screwed up even more. And so now the Philippines is saying, well, it looks like the U.S. is maybe screwing up less than China. So we really can actually thank the Communist Party for not, uh, not fulfilling its pledges. <laughs> I think, you, I think that's, that's well said, Matt. Well said. Now, I mean, I, I do think it's true that... Like they shoot themselves in the foot yeah. so often, right? Well, it's like like you said, Dave, you know, they're they're digging and they're trying to dig their way out of the problem. It's because they think that if you dig a hole from China, you'll get to the United States. Something like that. <laughs> you know the whole digging? You yes, dig a hole yeah, to China? I, okay. You should stop Look, digging now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know how to get out of this. <laughs> You're going to keep digging. I'm going I'm to dig. You're going to keep digging. The other part of it, I would say, is that, um, you know, in these various resupply missions, um, what's happened is that the Philippines, they are pushing back against China and, 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 and the PRC is becoming increasingly frustrated. So one thing that they, the, the uh, Philippine military and Coast Guard decided to do was, hey, let's 
do a political warfare pushback. Let's let's start inviting journalists with camera camera persons on board our ships, and we'll show the whole world that we're being bullied. And uh, th- they started that in, I guess, the first quarter of this year. And that's that's how we know and we can see and we can talk about uh, some of these these uh, uh, bullying tactics that China has has uh, pulled off. And and the Philippines is pushing back, and that's that's humiliating to China. And so, as an example, Shelley, <laughs> what happened was in these video narratives that we've been seeing coming out of the Philippines that are broadcast to the whole world, the Chinese have decided, hey, we're going to do the same thing too. And so they do the videos, only they doctor the videos. And so um, they don't have the same credibility. And so they, they're they saying that the Philippine ship attacked. But if you actually see the video, that's not what it shows. Or you can see from the wake of the of, of the vessel that the ship is actually backing up. It's not moving forward. And um, so they've been just humiliated by um, this pushback from the Philippines. And part of this, you know, when they did this rope cutting uh, exercise at Scarborough Shoal, I mean, I happened to be in the Philippines at the time, and it was broadcast over every radio station and and, uh, uh, every television station in living color. And the Filipinos are all going, you know, we're pushing back. We're pushing back. I definitely saw that rope cutting all over social media at the time as well. Uh, Just the idea that, you know, they're broadcasting the fact that they're cutting this rope made them seem very ballsy, right? I was going to say, it was a very baller move to just like send some divers down and just cut it. And then the the CCP's response, which was at first to like deny it, right? And then to be like, oh, well, no, we removed the net. They didn't remove the net. It just was... It it was dumb, but <laughs> what else can I say? I mean, I think it was very clever on the Philippines part. On the Philippines part, part yeah. yeah. And and you, you brought up political warfare. So um, can you tell us a bit about like what, besides obviously this, um, you know, showing v- accurate video of what's actually happening, like that's one piece of the Philippines political warfare, but what else are we seeing? And I'm asking sort of on both sides, the Chinese side as well. Well, okay, so uh, China is leveling the whole uh, wide array of uh, malign influence against the Philippines from uh, social media to its television stations to um, uh, really ugly economic warfare. Uh, the, the, the Chinese have... Uh, essentially taking control of uh, NGCP, which is their national grid corporation, the electric power situation for Metro Manila. Uh, They've got telecommunications control with Huawei and ZTE uh, in the Philippines uh, on the economic side, all kinds of investments and infrastructure. uh, uh, So the the economic side of the Philippines, the, the political warfare that the Philippines is facing um, Matt, it'd be kind of like if you imagined one leg that a country must stand on is its economic security, and um, wrapped around that leg is a python that's squeezing. And today, the Philippines has its left hand, not its right hand yet, but its left hand around the throat of that python and trying to unpeel it, unravel it. In our country, um, we're not as advanced on because we're not in the fight like the Philippines. So we're not as advanced in terms of an understanding of political warfare and in particular, the economic warfare that China is leveling against the United States. So if I take the same analogy, the python wrapped around the leg, we don't have our right hand wrapped around the neck of the python yet. We don't have our even have our left hand wrapped around the neck of the python yet. We do have, I would say, our fingernails into the neck a little bit. It's we got a long ways to go. And in terms of the political warfare side of things, the Philippines is fighting the same series of battles on all kinds of fronts that that we are in our country. They're just because they're on the front lines 
in a much more aware category than we are. Now, in terms of pushback, this whole concept uh, out in the maritime sector of having um, journalists on board, a transparency initiative, is one kind of a pushback. And there's another one that um, uh, we can talk about now. It used to be, a, a, I, I think, a pretty carefully guarded secret, and it's the concept is called Angels of the Sea. And this is an absolutely brilliant political warfare strategy that was conceived by then Deputy uh, Commandant of the Philippine Coast Guard, Ronnie uh, Gavan. Gavan is now the, the Commandant of the Coast Guard just recently. And so the concept is that he wanted to get something cultural in communicating with the Chinese that would absolutely fry the brain. And uh, Philippines has in their military and Coast Guard just superb officers and enlisted personnel who are women. And so he came up with this idea of using uh, women, and I know this may not be uh, politically correct in our country because I guess you would call it gender warfare, um, but his idea was, okay, we'll have the women communicating with the Chinese. And the reason we're going to do this is because they will, number one, not be expecting a female voice. And number two, coming from uh, uh, one-child families, this is like hearing from mother. And it fries the brain culturally. And so what happened is that if you see pictures on the internet of the bridge of a Philippine Coast Guard ship, typically you'll see on the right side of the bridge, there will be one or two women and they'll have, they'll be the communicators and they're communicating in English. Uh, and I suspect, I don't know for sure, but I think uh, occasionally in Mandarin, but mostly in English. And they're lecturing the Chinese about getting out of Philippine sovereign territory and getting out of the waters and they're doing things that are illegal. And it's like having their mother lecture them. And the female voice just absolutely fries the brain. Now, here's the part that's brilliant. Because it's tied in culturally, that type of pushback is really hard for the Chinese to train against because they have to be able to teach their uh, Coast Guard uh, personnel how to step around the cultural respect that they have for their mothers, women, aunties, and so forth. And, and, and it's causing all kinds of interesting problems. And it's kind of a hilarious pushback, if you ask me. And so we'll see some other political warfare, um, creative things uh, coming out of the Philippines. I think they, they're, they're, uh, they've got a lot of mental firepower they're putting on this. So it's, it's all good. That is uh, definitely an interesting and politically incorrect tactic. <laughs> but I, I can see it working. You know, this is like... The, the, the look when I talk to you, do you feel like I'm lecturing? Like you feel like you're hearing from your mother? No, it, it's it's actually just the look that you give me that stare. <laughs> like I I feel the power of that, and I'm terrified, Shelly. Uh, <laughs> you know, David, when you were talking about your <laughs> when you're talking about your Python analogy about how um, we maybe have our fingertips on the Python, we're, was, we're issuing strongly worded statements to the Python. No, I think we're like maybe petting the python like what happened this uh last week in a at apec with like xi jinping had that that dinner with all these business ceos right, right and yeah. you know like the the idea that like they would gather and like give him a standing ovation oh you mean the uh the kowtow dinner yeah so are we are we gonna choke the python are we gonna well i i you know i was trying to be as charitable as i could Shelley. Uh, and so you're probably more accurate. I mean, if you remember, I, I think many years ago, there was a, an article, um, and I, I believe it was, it may have been written by Matt Pottinger that was, had the title had something to do with the, the Python in the chandelier and, uh, and where we are today, the, the Python ain't in the chandelier anymore. It's wrapped around one of our legs as a country. And in terms of economic warfare, it's interesting that in, I guess it was 2015, the PLA published a, uh, published a book 
uh, and it talked about the importance of economic warfare is the most important um, because you can stymie the plans and the ability of a country to respond. And it, it, it's the crippling power. And so, you know, in, in the tropical, in the, the challenge with economic warfare coming against the United States or the Philippines is unless you are, are trained and, and unless you're aware of it, you can't see it. It's, it's, you know, it's one thing to talk about landing craft coming up on the beach. You can see that happening. Okay, we can see that kind of warfare or, or, or a building is blowing up. But um, when someone takes over, a country takes over your power grid for Metro Manila, for instance, and it turns out that um, the majority uh, uh, voting power contrary to Philippine law, has been turned over by way of a proxy to uh, the state grid corporation of China. And any repairs to the system have to be, Chinese engineers have to be flown in. And the control of the grid is, is run from Beijing. I mean, that's the kind of Python pulsing, wrapping around the leg that is really frightening. And your point, I think, Shelley, is that we're not at that awareness stage in our country of the danger, whereas President Marcos understands the problem with this power grid. And if I could tie it back to your comment about uh, uh, APEC, one of the things that occurred yesterday was that there was a signing of what's called a one, two, three agreement between the United States and the Philippines. And this was done at the sidelines of APEC. Now this one, two, three agreement um, has to do with non-proliferation of nuclear uh, devices and permitting civilian use. Now that's what the, the official statement and, and agreement is. But if you really look behind the backstory there of that agreement signed yesterday, was to permit the United States and the Philippines to jointly work together to provide, um, they're called uh, miniature nuclear uh, power plants. And this becomes really important for the Philippines for, not only for climate change, clean energy, okay, I get that. But it's, it's important to begin to unwrap this python around the leg, if you will, uh, and get an independent Philippine controlled power system for uh, Metro Manila and to try to get away from the Chinese controlled power system that they're under now. Because if you think about it in any terms of any time of conflict, if you have the switch to turn the electric power off in a country, boy, have you got an advantage. Uh, and so that was something that occurred just yesterday in San Francisco. Yeah, in the in the U.S., I remember was, uh, not too long ago that there was images captured of that giant Chinese spy balloon, right? And that was, you know, for most Americans, that was the most like visual obvious sign of, you know, the the Chinese Communist Party doing something to America. But at the same time, like you know, if you look at like say that the Chinese control of the port of Long Beach, one of the most important shipping ports in the U.S., like they're controlling the software that controls the loading cranes and that kind of, like you can stop almost all uh, shipping in the major U.S. ports uh, by essentially shutting off that system, right? Uh, so so there's, there's, all, there's all manner of things in this country as well that I think just 99% of people have no awareness of. Um, how do we change that? Well, Matt, the the... Here's the thing. I think our foundation has done the very first trainings ever done in the world on political warfare in reflecting on, on this type of education. One of the things that, um, you know, I've come to, to really understand is that there are really two problems here. The first is you've got to develop an awareness. That's the, that's the baby speed bump. And that's where you and Shelly and Chris are playing a really important role in, in developing awareness of this problem. And uh, 
having developed so that's going to take time and and you can see you can see it beginning to happen um let me give you one example while xi jinping held his kowtow supplicant dinner in san francisco um and there were a whole group of ceos that were there that's not representative of the business community of our country. Those are the CEOs that have a problem. And their problem is um, they have one foot bear trapped into the People's Republic of China with their current business operations. And they're trying to figure out some way to, to goose it up or get things back to the way it was so we can start, you know, making money again. And they're not aware, really understanding the risks of what they're doing. But I, what I've seen over the last several years is this big bleed out of American and foreign business out of China. And these companies, I mean, COVID certainly helped with that. These companies, when they make a decision to start to move their supply chains, Xi Jinping may think he can flip a light switch and cause the Chinese companies to all snap it to attention and change whatever they're doing, but that doesn't work in our society. You know, Biden can flip whatever switches that he wants and make whatever policy decisions that they want to in the Commerce Department and so forth, and okay, maybe they can ease off on export controls, or maybe they can change something on the sanctions. But when a company makes a decision, they're going to pull out of China and they're going to set up their pieces of their supply chain in Mexico or in Vietnam or wherever. That is a generation, if not multi-generational decision. They're not going to go back all that fast. And so this exercise that took, back, took place in San Francisco, basically what it does, I think, Shelley, is it shows us those companies and those CEOs that, to use your term, are not digging their fingernails into the neck of the python, they're petting the python, and they've, they've self-identified. But I don't really think that that's going to be where American business is going to go. I think, you know, people are starting to see, they can start to smell the rose now. And, it, and, and the work that, that you folks have done has been really instrumental in that, in teaching, because effectively what you're doing is you've been teaching uh, and building this awareness. And in due course, we'll get to the point where there's sufficient awareness that now comes the second speed bump, and that is, so what? What are you going to do about it? And that's where the rubber meets the road. And hopefully we will be able to learn some techniques and, and uh, uh, tricks, if you will, from some of our allies like the Philippines who are already in the fight. And we'll have to create some of our own and we'll have to stand up. And to use Dave Stilwell's uh, comments, uh, which I agree with, um, we're going to have to actually stand up and say, hey, part of our policy is we're going to contain China and we're going to do it for national security reasons and because China doesn't follow the rules of the road. And that may involve some reciprocity and some other, other challenges that we have to do, but our country is going to have to really start to push back. And right now, we're at this, the, the very, very beginning stages of having some, some statements. We haven't really done anything yet. So we have a long ways to go. We, we do have a long ways to go, but I do appreciate you saying that it's, you know, me and, and Chris and Shelly that are really leading the way. Mostly you, <laughs> Matt. <laughs> All right. um, David, before we go, do you have, you mentioned a little bit about we should learn some things from our allies like the Philippines. What do you think is the number one thing that U.S. needs to learn from the Philippines? Don't say balut. Wow. <laughs> wow. I think, Shelley, the biggest problem is this. Today, we have all these statements from our ambassador, from uh, our secretary of state, from our president, on and on about an ironclad uh, relationship standing shoulder to shoulder. And I think that um, we need a course mandatory course in the Foreign Service Institute for our State Department. That's the title of the course is called the Care 
and feeding of allies. It doesn't exist, I can tell you that right now. But I think the biggest thing that the United States needs to to learn to do is to to learn how to to be consistent and stand with our allies and support them. And it's not just the Philippines, it's stand with the UK, stand with Japan, stand with South Korea. And um, we could do a much better job of that. And in countries like the Philippines, um, it's the, the political situation on the ground is very complicated. There are a lot of cracks that are there that, that um, it's hard for our, our government officials who parachute in and parachute out to really understand the situation. So naturally, they make, make some boneheaded mistakes. But I think, I think the idea of, of becoming a friend, the most important thing about being a friend is, okay, what do we need to do? And one of the important things our country needs to do is we need to, to be able to help with this economic warfare situation. And the way that we do that is through trade and business to help strengthen the economy. This is in the Pacific Islands. This is throughout the whole first island chain. And, and this business of just trying to negotiate a, a framework for some kind of uh, business deal, trade deal, where there's no there there. It's, it's hollow. It's empty. You have a whole series of general pronouncements. That's not going to cut it. And what we need to be doing is strengthening our allies with real trade agreements and business deals. And um, I, I, I hope we get to a situation where our allies, uh, in terms of uh, maritime, shipbuilding, and aviation, and um, and munitions and cybersecurity, all these important national defense issues can help each other and uh, not just have our country supply all the artillery shells, for example. Some of our allies could be doing this. And the UK, I mean, the EU just announced they're not going to be able to donate any more artillery shells for Ukraine. But we shouldn't be in this kind of situation. And, and that's all about working as a true friend and then developing on the economic side of things. And that's where the real power of our country is, I think, is, is to stand on our rock and, and be a friend, if that makes sense. I think, I think it makes perfect sense. I mean, you know, it, it actually reminds me of something I think uh, Matt Turpin said in his uh, China newsletter about how really the, one, the battles of the new Cold War are going to be on the economic side and understanding economic and commercial security and how they relate to like geopolitics is going to be so crucial for the future. And that's um, not how we've been taught to look at um, trade and, you know, economics and all of that stuff in the last 30 years or so. This is where um, our leadership in Washington does not understand the economic warfare side or peace component, if you will, of, of, of political warfare. Because if you really understood that, then you would do something about it. And the business of having no there, there trade agreements, uh, does, that only helps China. And, and, and what, we, what I have heard repeatedly in, in the Philippines and Taiwan is, you know, we, we'd like to have a real trade relationship and more business with the United States. And how can we do this? And we need to have our, we need to have our government get in the fight, you know, and the, that's the difference um, in, in talking about these kind of issues with the Philippine officials is, Shelley, they have the smoke of battle all over them. And the reason is they are in the fight and they know it. In our situation, um, honestly, the best that we can get is some chest thumping and some statements from our leadership. They're not in the fight and they don't really understand it. They pretend to understand it, but they don't. And so this is where um, part of the burden for this teaching in the future comes to the three of you, Matt, Shelley, and Chris, keep it up. Well, I agree with that statement. <laughs> David, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be here. Aloha.
Well, I think it's pretty interesting to learn what's happening in the Philippines, and it kind of gives you hope to see uh, a country kind of turn it around and start really fighting the CCP uh, on this political warfare grounds, right? But one thing I noticed is that it is going to be hard to deal, like when David was talking about, oh, their grid, their power grid is controlled by China State Grid Corporation, or they have all this Huawei and ZTE equipment that they have to deal with now. Like it's pretty hard to to deal with this after you're so far in. And this is the concern I have with about the U.S. Like it feels like it usually takes some big crisis to wake people up. Should have been the spy balloon. I mean, that's not really a crisis, but yeah, there could have been. I mean. It, really should have been COVID. I was going to say, yeah, there, there was a thing that came from a Chinese lab, allegedly. <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> we are on YouTube. Yeah, I'm not allowed to say that because the censors are listening. But yes, I mean, to your point, yes. <laughs> I could, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that even though Chris wasn't here today, that you were here because while I make terrible jokes about digging to America... You basically rescue it with intelligent comments about like, you know, Matt Turpin's thing about, you know, economic something, something. Yes. The comment about <laughs> economic something, something is exactly what we're talking about now. Uh, it's well, been a long week. Thanks for watching anyway. I'm Matt Ganesta. I'm Shelly Zhang. And we'll talk to you next time.